Historically, many domesticated chicken flocks had no coop. The people who domesticated them long ago took advantage of their innate territorial nature. They knew that chickens would want to roost around the same place every night and that they would not roam far from that location during the day. Those homesteaders and farmers of both the ancient and relatively recent past relied on trees to house their birds at night, and they accepted the risk that it brought from predators or bad weather. Even in the Great Smoky Mountains, you can still sometimes find giant cedar trees in old homestead sites. These are the former roosting trees of flocks that have been long gone. Most of us now choose to build a coop for our birds. It keeps them safer at night, provides winter shelter, gives you an easy way to collect eggs, and can even become a source of garden fertility if managed properly. The range of coop designs are as varied as the huge array of bird breeds that they house. You can find everything from simple mobile chicken tractors made of PVC pipe, prefabricated coops from the hardware store, or even palatial stationary coops with their own water supply. Coops may be built into a barn or may even be their own standalone feature left in the backyard. So what kind of coop you decide to build from the dizzying list of options is dependent on several factors. The size of your flock, the size of the land, the weather of your region, your budget, just to name a few. Since a coop is, therefore, such a personalized structure, I'm not going to sit here and tell you which coop is the best. Instead, let's talk about the basic features that all good coops need so that you can build or buy the one that fits you and your chickens and your philosophy best. I'll be using my coop as an example, but of course, rest assured, there's far more than one way to house a chicken. <laughs> well then, after going through the basic features, we'll go into some of the different types of coops that you can consider as you get ready to house a flock. When choosing or designing a good coop, there are some generally non-negotiable features that must be included for the comfort and security of the birds, as well as for the utility of the humans. There's lots of coop designs out there, but for simplicity's sake, I'll discuss elements of a stationary standalone coop and then we'll branch out from there. So let's start with the coop proper. It should have a roof and strong walls, and if you live in cold climates, it might be a good idea to insulate them to keep your birds more protected in the winter. You certainly don't want a coop to be airtight though. Draft-free ventilation is key for healthy birds. On my coop, for example, there's air access all around the eaves, and the doors are open all day. While we're talking about the eaves, I should also mention that I strongly recommend making your coop at least seven feet tall so that there's plenty of head space for you and for air to move around. Chores are much more pleasant if you don't have to awkwardly hunch. The next element to consider is the size of the coop and the size of the run. In all circumstances, I recommend you make it as big as you can, because the more space a chicken has, the healthier and happier it will be. Books and online resources will give a general estimate that four square feet per bird is the minimum required for a coop if the chicken has outside access as well. If the birds are entirely cooped up with no outside space, which is a rather sad fate in my opinion, it's recommended to give each bird 10 square indoor feet. If you have just a small backyard flock of three or four birds, try to give them more space than that. That minimum will give you a coop that's really not much bigger than a dog cage. Accessibility is the next important element, but you have to make sure it's accessible to only the creatures and people you want to get into the coop in the first place. A coop like mine has three doors. There's a human-sized access door to get to the coop, and the latch is complicated, a kind of closure that requires two hands. You don't have to have a sliding design like ours, of course, but do try to make it multi-stage. Raccoons in particular are clever animals with hand-like paws, and they can easily turn an unlocked doorknob or flip a simple latch. The next door is a human-sized door that can get into the run. The third door is a chicken-sized door that allows the birds to both be released from the coop or separated from the run when I want to clean it. Either make sure this door is low enough that the birds can access it from the ground or build a ramp with a gentle slope. If your birds are totally enclosed in a coop and a run, being able to temporarily block them from coming to one side or the other makes chores a ton easier. We can also open and close this door without going in the coop, which is super convenient. An extra element that we've added to our coop to limit avian accessibility is an admittedly annoying to install yet useful layer of bird netting around the outdoor run. Every spring we have flocks of cowbirds invade our acreage, and until we put up the netting, they were making a habit of feasting on our chicken food every morning. Now they've got to go find their dinner elsewhere. The next element of the coop design is the roosting area. If you remember from our earlier lesson on red jungle fowl, it's built into a chicken's instincts to find a high protected area to sleep at night. 
The highest perch you provide in the coop will be the most desired spot, so you can guess where your rooster will claim his sleeping space. Now, bantam birds will require less space, of course, but for full-sized chickens, anticipate providing at least 8 inches of perching space per bird. We use an old broom handle in our coop. Any smooth, round wood works great. Old wooden ladders set at an angle are another great way to upcycle a perch in minutes. The only time you really don't need to fuss with perches is if you're only raising quick-growing broilers. Since they never reach maturity and they're too heavy anyway, they're not likely to roost on a perch at night. After establishing perches, the next logical thing to talk about is what goes on under the perches, the litter that will line the bottom of the coop. As the chickens roost for the night, they digest and poop, so whatever is directly beneath the roosting area will be liberally dotted with droppings by the morning. Provide plenty of litter in the bottom of the coop, and this poop pile will be the raw material for some wonderful compost in the future. You can use many things for litter, but a short list includes straw, fall leaves, corn cobs, corn husks, wood shavings, and dried grass clippings. The chickens will delight in scratching this material into easy to break down bits. The coop never needs to smell bad if you keep enough litter at the bottom. If you ever catch a whiff of stinky smell, merely add more dry litter and it will go away. The birds will mix it in and the smell will disappear. Once you have built up a deep layer of this bedding mixture, you can actually remove the bulk of it and let it break down for next year's garden in a compost pile. Then just add more dry bedding beneath the birds and they'll set to work on making your next batch of garden fertility. Next, let's talk about nesting boxes. Hens are naturally inclined to find dark, clean, dry, private areas to lay their eggs. When you provide that space for them, you're setting up a beautiful partnership. A good size for a nesting box is 14 by 14 by 12 inches. A five gallon bucket turned on its side and filled with dry bedding is also decent, made in five minutes nesting box. Although you'll need to attach something to the front opening so that the nest is held in. Just put something across the first two inches at the bottom. A bar located a few inches in front of the opening of the nesting boxes will also allow the chickens to reach them more comfortably. Another area that you'll need to provide for your birds is a dusting area. If they free range, they'll find it for themselves. But if they are contained in an enclosed run, make sure that there's an area of ground where they can kick up dust and get themselves clean. I purposely put dry earth, occasionally mixed with ashes for pest control in a corner of our run. The chickens take care of the rest. Now the last consideration I'll briefly mention is predator control. We'll be discussing that in much more detail in a few lessons, but chief among your coop design concerns should be knowing what predators are active in your area and building in defenses against those specific carnivores. A flimsy coop is merely snack packaging to some hunters. Now our area, for example, has a lot of digging type predators such as dogs and badgers. So we ringed our coop around with buried chicken wire and a thick layer of boulders and gravel. Just an example of things that you can do. Now with all those design elements covered, there's many manifestations of a coop that you could create. The classic design is a standalone structure, a stationary building. This could be home base for a flock of free ranging birds, it could have an attached run, or it could even have four different doors to open up to four different fenced ranges. That allows you to rotationally graze. In whatever case, it's important to position the stationary coop uphill on a slightly sloped land so that all the rainwater that falls drains downhill. Chickens do not mix well with muddy ground and standing water. Another way to rotationally and intentionally graze a flock is to have a mobile coop. You can move it either by hand or have a tractor tug it and have movable fencing as well. If you have enough property, you can move your flock and your coop to new ground every day or every week. Now a variation on that idea is the increasingly popular chicken tractor. This is a low impact, low cost, three season means of housing chickens that's often used with meat birds. Since they're gonna be butchered around fall, there's no need to make winter protection. And since they're not gonna reach egg laying maturity, there's no need to put in nesting boxes. I'll point you towards Joel Salatin. He's one of the go-to resources on chicken tractor design and use. I'll share more about him in the resources section at the end of this course. Now, whether you opt for a pre-made coop from the feed and tractor store, design and build your own, or repurpose an existing structure to become your chicken haven, I hope you now feel a little bit more equipped to adequately house your birds and give them all the things they need. If you have yet to acquire that first flock, have fun dreaming and browsing through all the hundreds of different ideas available online, and don't be afraid to come up with your own.